Welcome back to the core human relations in world missions and last we were together we finished off the section concerning the missionary and his God talking about the word of God and the missionary continual education of the word that we never stop learning and we talked a lot about being subject to change and allowing God to keep changing you again and again we talked about prayer and the missionary continual communication with God that prayer intercession, that intimacy with the Spirit of God, developing that relationship, the number one thing that will keep you alive and well on, on the mission field, no matter what you have to confront or what you have to face. And we talked also about worship and the missionary. And I told you that story of that amazing outpouring of the Spirit that happened during that wild praise session that broke the yoke on that community. Which, by the way, after that, that community changed radically. In fact, right after that happened, interestingly, in that Etapa 19, that section on, in that project, the Presidente, which is the president of that section, so the Presidente de, de, de la Etapa, the president of the section, uh, there was a woman, and she suddenly felt motivated to demand that the place be cleaned up the people of the community, because usually there was trash everywhere, the people started working together as a community to clean up more, to police things, to make it look nicer, to paint things, and it started changing its appearance. And she went as far as to have replaced all of the street lamps. Now, I know you're thinking, well, we, of course, street lamps are always, no, no. In this community, I'm telling you, 90% of the street lamps were busted out. The vandals broke them out. And nowhere in the entire community were there many street lamps. In fact, maybe 10% of them, I'm not exaggerating, were actually functioning at that time. Almost all of them were broken. There were always those tennis shoes hanging over the power lines, you know, for the drug dealers. And this was just a bad area, slum. We used to take care of the street kids that would come and have us doctor up their wounds. They had bottle glass cuts in their heads because they would beat each other with broken glass bottles and we would put mercurochrome on them and bandage them up and give them a meal and uh, we were there. But the president of the Etapa, in coordination with the voting body of that community after this, they felt this urgency to replace the lights. And one night as I was driving back from the main city, the main highway was at the bottom of the mountain, and the mountain went straight up to the peak. And this Etapa, I mean this El Coloso, the project, was covering that side of the mountain. And Etapa 19 was just one spot way at the top. And as I was driving up on the main highway, looking up the mountain, the Lord said that He has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And when I looked up, <laughs> wow! Just only Etapa 19, that little segment up there, was shining with bright white light. Not because of the Holy Spirit, mind you, but because the actual physical lamps, every single street light was fixed in only Etapa 19. Now, say what you want, but I saw it as a supernatural thing manifested in a physical dimension. And it was glowing. Other communities were kind of mocking it, and how could it be? And so, um, you know, the community, the community would look at it and say, "Wow, that's incredible!" You know that that they have their lights, and that motivated them to do the same. But I saw that as a result of spirit of God and worship. So. We can make a difference in communities by bringing the Holy Spirit there. God is the one that does it. We just usher it in and we do the best we can. So now we're going to continue here in Human Relations and World Missions with the second segment. We've seen the first fifth of this series on Human Relations and World Missions, which was the missionary and his God. And now we go on to the missionary and the sending church. So we start by declaring here that the relationship between the missionary and the local church that sends him or her out to the field must remain strong through the years of the missionary or that the missionary is serving in the different nations of the world. In order to make this a reality, we will cover 
three primary areas of this relationship if the missionary is submitted to the sending church during the time of preparation for the field all involved will trust him or her as a man or a woman of God in other words if the missionary is well connected to the sending church and the relationship is there as the missionary goes forward there will be a connection that never ends and the first of these three sections here we see the relationship between the missionary and the pastor of the local church very important so we begin by looking at a passage of scripture that we find in acts chapter 13 let's read these few verses there in the beginning now in the church at antioch there were prophets and teachers barnabas Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now we see here the church at Antioch, we see prophets and teachers, and it even names them here, including Saul of Tarsus, who is the Apostle Paul. We see them worshiping together. We see them fasting together. Then we see the Holy Spirit himself speaking through them, asking for individuals in that group, in that church, to be set apart to be separated from the others as special people, special ministers, and that was by name Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul. For what? For the work to which I've called them, a work that meant that they were to go out to other areas to preach the gospel. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and set them off. Now we see so many factors here that are important. We begin by reading that Paul was part of a local church that he recognized as his church of origin and before the Church of the Nation. In other words, he went out and planted a lot of churches, but his connection with Antioch in the, scripture is, in the Scriptures are very clear, which, first of all, it does not mean that he was born again in this church because he was not. Now, I would say that his day of conversion was the road of Damascus, obviously, where he was on his way with the letters to arrest those people of the way and put them in prison and even persecute them or prosecute them to the point of death if necessary. And he did, he did work even to stone a lot of people and kill the people that believed in Christ. But that road on Damascus to Damascus when he was gone, Jesus met him in a bright light, shined on him and caused his conversion. He had this metamorphosis in his life where he believed in Jesus. Who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I'm Jesus. And he says, okay, then he accepted him at that moment. Now, that's salvation. Later, Ananias, three days after he was blind the whole time, came and laid hands on him and he received the Holy Spirit. So now his first experience in Christ caused him to become a part of the church that was in Jerusalem. And that's exactly what Ananias did. Ananias took him to meet the apostles and at that time he integrated into the way or the body of Christ as it was but then ended up learning and developing under different ministries one of which was of course the um, he learned in grew with Ananias for the, his first mentor you could say was Ananias I'm sure that Ananias did a lot more than simply um, as you say pray for him to receive the Holy Spirit. He explained a lot of things to him, and it says he did, but when he went to the church in Jerusalem, they taught, they taught him many, many more things. And in doing that, he grew. But that led him from relationship to relationship to more and more people, and as a result, eventually he became exactly who he was meant to be. But after that time, before during the 14 years before he went out, he became an integral part of, and from what we can determine there at the church at Antioch, he was one of the resident prophets and teachers functioning in that place. And as they were all together, that's where he received his first biblically clear commission to the mission field. So I want to talk about that sending church, as we call it. I have that. I have a sending church in my life. And so 
the church at Antioch had been planted by the believers of Jerusalem as a mission and was growing stronger and stronger to such an extent that it was sending leaders out to work abroad in other countries. Now, the pastor of the local church has been established by God to serve as a guide and teacher of the future missionaries of the church. During the stay of the missionary in preparation in the local sending church, the pastor plays an extremely important role in the missionary's life. And of course, all the mentors do, but the pastor takes the priority. I've already told you I've had um, many mentors. I started out and all of them had interest in missions. In fact, it's interesting that although in my church overall there was not an extreme interest in missions, nor was there any missionaries that I was aware of, with the exception of Lucille Crabtree, who became the first missionary, the one that went before me. They supported missions here and there, and they knew about missionaries, and they regularly received missionaries that would come and preach in the church, like David Hogan, and also like Danny Ost, and some great men of God that were doing great works, who were certainly inspirations to me. But at that time, they were not exactly what I would call a missions church, but they were starting moving toward that as things changed. But it just so happened that all of the people that I connected to had a real vision for missions also. Certainly, Mike Caminita was the one that really followed the ministry of Keith Green, and he's the one that turned me on to the you know, No Compromise and also the, the, um, the Last Days newsletters that were these magazines that they would make about these issues which were filled with missions because Keith Green was someone who went to the mission field and had his entire mind changed. He had a paradigm shift to realize that he we had to go to the nations and he became a very strong advocate to send people and spent a lot of time and money sending and preparing people to be missionaries before he died in a tragic plane accident and, and his life was ended. But that particular influence was already there in my mentors. And this went all the way up. My pastor had already been to multiple nations teaching and preaching the gospel and had a regular relationship with missionaries. And that's why David Hogan was there and preached by invitation of my pastor. And he had a relationship with him. There was once that we traveled with David Hogan from New Orleans all the way over to a place in Mississippi. It was about a three-hour drive, and I got to actually go in the vehicle with David Hogan for three hours there, be with him in the service for a couple hours, and drive um, three hours back. I got hours with him. That's the day that he prophesied to me. That's the, the day that he laid hands on me. I mean, amazing things happened. This, of course, was... This was long after that first encounter I had when I went forward and tried to go to the mission field with him in the beginning when I felt the call to missions. But these people were in a place in the church, but my pastor was always the center. My pastor was the one who observed this call on me, diagnosed it, began to watch it, and started to carefully, with wisdom, nurture it so that I would become what I needed to become. My pastor served as my spiritual father here on earth, and I constantly remember the things he had taught me when I finally went to the farm field. In fact, the very first missions trip that I went on to the mission field, it was my pastor who led that trip. So Ken Dunbar took me to the mission field. I remember being wowed at watching him. It was the first time I saw someone preach and it be interpreted into another language. I remember just that was amazing to me. I remember being wild on that mission trip, watching my pastor preach, it being interpreted in people receiving exactly the same way we receive from his ministry and weeping. I remember seeing the anointing. I remember seeing prophecy come forth from my pastor over people and it being interpreted into Spanish. At that time I knew no Spanish at all, but I just, I was so full of glee just to be in the middle of it. And my pastor was my missions hero because look at him up there teaching and preaching and doing what he's doing. I was amazed. So he was that image to me from the very beginning of missions. And so as I began to grow, one of the obligations I had in my relationship with the pastor, which is kind of like the president or the prime minister of the church, he's the head, the leader, the spiritual guide, I had to convince the pastor of 
my mission's call. And that's what we have to do. If we're in a church and we feel that God is calling us to the mission field or any kind of ministry, we have an obligation to convince our spiritual leader of this call in our life. Now, many pastors do not wish to release their sheep, of course. And this can be a serious problem for the prospective missionary. It is our responsibility to communicate our vision to the pastor, attempting to convince him of the call in our lives. If the pastor of your sending church does not believe that you are called, you will not be able to count on him in support of you when you go to the mission field, nor will you be able to count on him to even send you in the first place. Now, in saying this, I'm not saying it's impossible for you to go to the mission field if your pastor does not decide to send you. I have seen missionaries make it without the support of their pastors, without the support of their sending churches, because there are times when people just simply will not have a vision to do what God is calling you to do. That's why it's your vision. It's not always their vision. I thank God I was in a church not, although not the most missions-minded church, they did allow missions, but it took some work, it took some time, it took some convincing. And so here I want to talk to you about four things we can do to convince our pastor of the mission call on our life. Now remember throughout this entire course, we're applying this to the face of ministry in general. Let's say that you are a member of your congregation and at that time that you are um, with your pastor, you suddenly, you're telling him that you feel like God's called you as a pastor, or God's called you as a teacher, or you feel like God's calling you as a prophet. Okay, great. Pastors are used to hearing this all the time. Church leaders will hear people say these things all the time. But you are the one responsible to work that ministry out. We don't tell the pastor and the pastor takes it upon himself to turn us into something. That's not the way it works. It's not an apprenticeship program that is decided from the top down. It is decided from inside the human heart upward. In other words, the Holy Spirit is in charge. The Spirit said separate Barnabas and Saul. The Spirit speaks through the amalgam of the believers, but the Spirit speaks to you first and it's confirmed. I'm sure the Apostle Paul was already deeply considering preaching the gospel to people that had never met the Lord before. I'm sure Barnabas was also. And that when the Spirit said separate them, it's because they were already in a position. They were predisposed within themselves, I promise you, predisposed within themselves to do that for God. They were willing. They had already said, here am I, send me. They were already interceding. I'm not, I don't know this scripturally for sure, but I would, I would bet... I would bet that they were. I would almost want to bet my life on it because he was a very internationally minded person to begin with. He grew up in Tarsus, which was an international port city. So Paul had these focuses. But he still was in an amalgam of believers that were going to have to be convinced. In this case, they didn't need a lot of convincing because Paul already had experience in ministry. He also had international connections and knew what it was like to cross culture to communicate from his upbringing. He already was a Roman citizen, which was a huge advantage over a lot of other people. So he was a unique individual, but now the Spirit says it. So a part of the agreement in worship and fasting was there, but also the part of the Spirit's voice saying, this was his purpose. That is one of the greatest things they could convince your pastor. But there are natural things you can do also. The first above any other is this. You must be faithful in your local church. I say this because there is a lot of infidelity out there on people that believe they're called to mission. So if you're faithful in the work in which you're born as a believer, the pastor will be able to recognize that you will probably be faithful abroad. You know what I mean? And I write here that I've spoken to many pastors with respect to this concept and have had to agree with many of them understanding the reasons for not wanting to send those claiming to be a missionary who were doing nothing in the local church to begin with to substantiate those claims. In other words, they weren't already functioning. Before you go to the mission field, and before I went to the mission field, I first served my pastor like a slave. I function in all the realms of ministry. In fact, everything I did on the mission field 
on my way, all the way to my first commission in planting of the church in southern Mexico, everything was in service to people. Before I ever left my country, I already was functioning in every realm of ministry in which I function now. I already was leading worship. I was already preaching. I was already evangelizing. I already prayed for the sick and saw them recover. I already was regularly prophesying. I was already regularly moving in the gifts. This took place in the first couple of years. I was on the fast track. I knew I need to hone these skills now in the safety net of my home church. I need to do this in relation to my pastor. So my pastor was watching this. And many people were saying, Stephen does this, Stephen does that. Stephen is prophesying. Stephen is d preaching in this group. Stephen went to this cell group and he prayed for this woman and she got healed. Stephen went out on the streets and this prostitute received Jesus and she came to church on Sunday. All these things the pastor was watching. Well, these were pretty clear indications that my function was already happening. So when I started speaking about going to the mission field, it made more sense to him than it might have been from someone that was doing nothing. In other words, when we talked about vision, I told you that it has to be practicable. You have to take first initiating steps. I took all these steps long before I ever went to the mission field. I was already functioning there. Sometimes I go to a church and um, I know this because I preach, and I told you I have influenced well over a thousand missionaries to become missionaries, and I've trained over a hundred personally and sent them. But I have noticed that sometimes people in churches where I speak get very motivated and excited about becoming a missionary, and so I, I spend time praying for them, maybe in an altar call, and I encourage them. The first thing I ask them when they come and say, I believe God, it's just like David Hogan did to me, they do to me, they'll come and say, brother, I just feel like the Lord wants me to go with you on the mission field. And I always do the same thing David did to me. I say, well, praise God, let's talk to your pastor. At the time David did it to me, I didn't understand what he was doing, but I understand it perfectly now. Because the pastor is the one that has to make the choices here. And the pastor is the one that will let you know as the missionary whether this guy is doing anything for God or not yet. And so the first thing I tell people is, praise God. I am so enthusiastic along with you about this call you feel to the mission field, but let's talk to your pastor about this. Let's see what kind of plan we can make. And so we go to the pastor. And I get different feelings when I do this. When this moment comes and the brother or the sister is with me who said they're called as a missionary, we go see the pastor. Sometimes while we're still walking over to the pastor, the pastor looks at us coming and does this. And I know, uh-oh, this guy's in trouble. And immediately I know there's something, there's some lack of proof of his validity. And when I go and I tell the pastor, look, brother, brother, whoever, brother Joe here, you know, Nancy here has just told me they feel like they're called to the mission field. And I said, we need to talk to you. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, they do a pastor response. And sometimes they say, okay, well, um, I'll talk to you later about that, brother. And then they finish the service and that guy goes home. And then we end up having a dinner after. And it comes up at the dinner table. Not in the presence of the one that wants to be the missionary, but just me and the pastor. And the pastor will tell me, well, let me tell you something about this guy. First of all, he always has these questions that never seem to be answered. And we've given him a lot of opportunities in the local church to serve, and he, he never shows up. We have yard work day, and we look for people to come work in the yard and do the gardening. He's never come. We have painting day where we're going to paint the church house, and he doesn't come. We do that. They start naming, interestingly, they start naming functions, physical functions. Because what they know, and I know, as veteran ministry, missionary or local minister, same thing, is ministry is work. Remember, we talked about that a couple of segments ago. If this person is not working already, that pastor, the last thing he's going to want to do is curse me with a weight and a burden of some super spiritual person who has no practical application on the mission field whatsoever. That would be a bad recommendation. And we would have a falling out. And I would have a contentious bone to pick with that pastor. What did you give me here? Now, I saw this happen. When I worked with Ruth Ann and Victor Martinez in northern Mexico while I was there, I noticed that Ruth Ann is the sweetest woman on earth. And she 
he, she and her husband, Victor, would open up to anybody to come to the mission field. They didn't, they had no barriers, no walls. They were like Jesus, just praise God, come, come, let's serve the Lord. Let's see what the Lord has for us together. So they didn't have a big filtration process sometimes about who came down. They ran these people in different churches. Sure enough, though, often these people were problematic individuals that did not fit in their churches, were ne never did anything really for the church but caused trouble. And basically the pastor was happy to hear them say they wanted to go somewhere else. It's like, I will send you, I will lay, I will lay hands and feet on you to kick you out the door. In other words, just get out of here. Great. Amen. Praise God. Bye-bye. You're out of here. I heard one pastor say, well, sometimes when you really don't like somebody, you just kind of prophesy them out the door. And of course, we shouldn't do that, but it was a joke, meaning that, you know, I just, I just feel God is calling you to greener pastures. He's telling you to go out. He has a work for you. And basically, it's like we're trying to get them out of your life because they are worthless. That's why the fruit of the Spirit, one of them being that term that we talked about, uh, about our usefulness, it's called gentleness in the King James, but it actually means your usefulness. How useful are you? It's a fruit of the Spirit to be useful, crastotes, and that you are applicable in every situation. You're a hard worker, and no matter what has to be done, you do it. See, that's missionaries, that's ministers. That A minister is a waiter, remember, a waiter at table, a worker, a slave, a doulos, permanent slave. That's what God calls. He's looking for servants. And these people who have not learned to serve in the local church, the pastor will never recommend them unless he's trying to get rid of them. And boy, I've seen some wild and crazy people in the mission field. I vowed then I'm not going to take these insane people in my ministry in the future. Sometimes you learn in ministries what not to do. Hats off to Victor and Ruth Ann for being so loving and accepting these people. And honestly, they had a broader infrastructure with a lot of guest facilities that they could do that without incurring too much expense. But not me. I've never had that big of a structure to deal with. If I bring somebody who is worthless to the mission field. I, man, I've had a lot of people come to the mission field for the core, this program you're doing now. Often we do this and people come and stay on the mission field with us for the three months they go through the core. And I have done, you know, well over a hundred students that way through the years. We've done it in different nations. When I did the core in India, we would have the pastors come from the villages and live in apartments that Myra set up for them to stay in dormitories and also, she would help host missionaries that would come from America, and she's seen some crazy people come and go there too. But because we have to give everybody a chance to see, and in that regard, we know all different people come, but I have seen people come to the mission field, and after just a few weeks, I, for the life of me, I have no idea why they're there. Don't know why they even come. They, they're not really interested. They, I had one person that all they ever did in class was file their nails. That's it every single class filing their nails. I just, I couldn't, couldn't handle it. Why come? Why even be here? What's the purpose? It has to be, you have to be driven from the heart. You have to desire it. And when pastors ask me later about their, these people, what do you think about so-and-so after the, after going to the program? What do you think? And I, I, I've been real honest and said, well, honestly, I, I think they can file their fingernails just as easily back at home than on the mission field. And it certainly would be a lot cheaper. And the pastors just say, okay, amen. Sometimes I have to be honest because I don't want to waste their time and energy. So I'm, I'm giving you all these as a perspective of what your pastor sees in you when you're trying to show him that you are called. But if you're faithful in the work in which you're born as a believer, then the pastor is going to be able to recognize and see it. Now, on the opposite you know, I can say this, that when I was being prepared for the mission field and when Ruth Ann and Victor, as people that were going to take me into their ministry, asked the pastor about me, my pastor's recommendation was high. It was very valuable. And he said he's a very hard worker. When I went to um, my Bible school, the, the pastor there or the brother in charge, Brother Jim Clark, also that was my report with him to them was dedicated, very focused, 
never missed a lesson. You know, like he, he spoke about our fidelity in the program. So a, a good reputation went before us to be able to open doors for us wherever we went. And that come from the people under which we served, pastors, etc. So we need to endeavor to be able to have those kind of relationships. Number two is you have to confess your vision. Remember we're talking about the vision that God gives you and what he puts in your heart. Well, now we're talking about your relationship with the pastor, of course, is you must confess or speak out your vision. When one believes that God has truly called them to be a missionary or a minister of any kind, they cannot cease from speaking about the dreams and desires they feel for the nations. That's exactly right. It burns inside of you like a fire. Like fire shut up in your bones. Whatever the mandate of the Lord is, it, it is bubbling out of you. I constantly spoke of the nations to my pastor before he had decided to let me go. Everything that I did was in preparation for my life on the field. Honestly, everything I did was to make that happen. I forever told everyone about my dreams and this showed my pastor how serious I was about the call. Because that's all I ever said and all I ever did and all I ever told every, anyone was I'm going to the mission field and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and God is calling me and I'm passionate about this. And did you know that in Mexico this and, and did you know this and that? And did you know the planets of the, I um, mean, um, the nations of the planet are this, that and the other? Man, I'm so excited. I, I, I want to go anywhere God calls me to go. I'm already considering, of course, I might be too old, but wouldn't it be fun if I was actually able to train a minister that would go work in a foreign colony, even in another planet? I would love to have some of my spiritual disciples become chaplains in the Mars space or something like that. That would be, that'd be amazing. To the, to, you know, beyond the uttermost of the world, I would be able to say in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the world and other worlds, that would be fantastic. They need Jesus too. Believe me, if, if Elon Musk and the others have their way, there will be a thriving community on the surface of Mars in the remainder of my lifetime already and certainly in the lifetime of my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It's possible that they would be able to go there as spiritual representatives of Christ. Wouldn't that be fascinating? I'm totally open to it. be a really cool series of novels I could write about being a space missionary. I know that sounds crazy, but I like crazy sometimes. So as we're looking at this, we know we, we do these things. We will, as I say, confess our, our vision. Number three, we must pray for our pastors. And this is the most important thing because God is the one that changes hearts. Ask God to directly speak to your pastor concerning your future. This is how the doubt can be erased. There are different ways that your pastors, I mean your prayers can pay off to your pastor. Number one, he can hear God's voice. You understand? that as you're praying for your pastor, you have to understand the position he's in. He is he is given the obligation to shepherd you, which means sometimes to protect you and keep you locked in the pen. Otherwise, you're going to wander out into the field when the wolves are out there. So he knows how to guard you and keep you safe and sequester you when, when necessary in a corral. And so often he's going to limit your activities. It's not because he hates you. It's because he's protecting you. And if the aforementioned inaction is there, you're a member of your church and you're not doing anything or volunteering for any of the physical work and the pastor and the leaders are having to do it all the time, well, then you're worthless to them. It's about your functionality. That's what ministry is. So having laid all that down, now you've done everything. You're working hard like a slave, which I did in my home church, doing everything that had to be done. Now you have to pray. Beg God to reveal to your pastor, Lord, show my spiritual authority this anointing that's on my life, this call on my life. I need their help. This is the way I'm actually going to bring you into my prayers that I pray. This is the way I would pray. Heavenly Father, please, I respect the system of authority in the local church. I know that they have been put in that place to protect me. But God, I need to break out of this church. I need to go and they need to send me. So I'm begging you in Jesus' name that you would touch their hearts and show them this. And this is exactly the way I prayed. And so the Lord started 
touching my pastor's heart. And my pastor had prophecies, and my pastor had visions about me, and prophesied over me, being on the mission field. Prophecy can come forth. And by the way, not only does prophecy come forth over, over uh, me from him, or over the missionary from the pastor, but from external sources also to confirm and that's another thing I really asked for, was for God to confirm that call. Because there was actually quite a bit of opposition. And there we pray for the pastor, prophecy can come forth. I'm talking about that. When I was praying for the pastor, also the leadership of the church, and we're going to get more into that in the next section on how I relate to the other brothers in the church. But with my pastor, he was not keen to let me go, nor were the leaders. And remember, they just thought I was a dreamer anyway. And so I desperately needed the intervention of God. And so after long prayers, hours of begging God to reveal it to my pastor, interestingly, the individual minister who came to visit and, and um, preach at our church, he was a preacher that was going to go to the mission field to Germany. And he had already been there on mission trips and was planning to go there full time and in his preparation he had an encounter with God when he was younger where he said he saw Jesus floating in a room and as a result of that experience he had God told him what to do and that was to be a missionary and at this point he's back in the United States and he's working there and teaching he has a ministry there he teaches a lot about Hebrew culture and he teaches the Hebrew language he has courses online if you're interested his name is Buzz Treme I have not been connected to him in a, in a social sense in a long time. But back then, he came to our church when I was only 18, 19 years of age. And at that time, I was not getting a green light from the, from the pastor nor the leaders. They were all just praying about it. Hallelujah, we'll pray about it, we'll pray about it. And that often means you're not doing anything. And so I was stagnant and angry and frustrated, but I was dependent upon God crying out, Lord, please, you've got to tell him, you've got to tell him. And my wife and I were in agreement about this. And we were praying all the time, begging God to speak to the leaders in the church about us going to the mission field. Because by the way, through all of this, you hear me talk about me, 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 this, this, I, I. It's Barbara and me together. Barbara and I have always been there side by side through all of this with the same passion and same idea. When I say I, I mean we because we are one body, one flesh. My wife and I are one individual, one soul. So here in this case, we're focused, we're looking, we're hoping, and we're begging God. And this missionary that I told you about happens to be visiting and a guest speaker at our church. And I was not aware of that. It was last minute, it was decided in the church between services and it was a surprise on a Sunday morning. At that time we had Sunday morning services and we had midweek services and a prayer service on Tuesdays and different Bible studies in different places. Now, at this moment, I wake up that morning, it was a Sunday morning, and my wife pops up out of bed and she says, we're gonna receive a word of confirmation for our ministry in Mexico today. And when she said that, my heart was beating. It's like, why, why do you say that? She said, I just know it. And I said, okay. So we got up excited out of bed, got ready, got dressed, and went to church. We go to church all excited, and all of a sudden we see this strange man up there we've never seen before. We whisper to someone, who's that? One of the leaders of the church tells, oh, he's a missionary. He's coming. He's sharing this morning. The pastor's going to have him um, do the morning service for us. And I, I was so excited because I knew what Barbara said was real. It has to be. And so we go through the service, and uh, you may have heard this story before, but I love telling it because it's so much fun. And I know this brother later, in fact, years later, he recounted this story to me, so I know the details from all angles and also from my pastor and the leaders in the church. And the subject here, remember, is that when your pastor doesn't believe and doesn't agree, although you're doing everything you can, first doing all the work, now it's up to praying for him. So as I'm praying and begging God for this, the Brother gets up, he preaches a great message, he shares an exciting testimony about his encounters with God. Then he starts operating in the gifts of the Spirit. He leaves the platform, steps down into the congregation, he's walking through, and I'm like so excited where I'm trying to be seen. You know, when somebody is prophesying in a church service, you have two groups of people. You have people trying to be seen and people trying to hide. 
There are some people that are like, amen, amen, and some people are, oh my, oh my. They're bowing their head. In this case, I was uh, 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 looking, I was like a dog looking for a treat. <laughs> and he looked at me and just kind of looked past me like I was nuts. And he walked to the back and prophesied to other people. And he finished. And he went up to the front. And he quit, and he gave the microphone back to the pastor, and he took the microphone and said, um, Brother Thinking, Pastor Ken took the microphone back, and that preacher went and went, went to the back and disappeared, and I'm sitting there crushed and broken and angry because my wife, is my wife a false prophetess? She said it would happen, and it didn't happen. And I was, I was just depressed, and I kept looking back at the brother who was the back of the church. He's, he didn't care. He's back there having water. I'm bitter inside, angry. It was supposed to be. He missed God. Somebody missed God. Something went wrong. But then suddenly the pastor takes the microphone. He says, Hallelujah, we had such a good service that we're going to have the brother come back tonight, 6 p.m. right here. Come on back. He's going to have another service with us. Whereby I knew, amen, that's for me, that's the time. We went away that day, we had our lunch. I was, I could not wait. I was so excited, I was nervous all day. We come back to the evening service, same as the morning. Great message, great preaching, wonderful time with this brother. He's finishing the service, just like he did in the morning service. Now it's probably around 8 o'clock, 8.15. He's finishing. He was a little long-winded, maybe about an hour and a half or so preaching. He gets to the end of that moment. He's ministering in the gifts of the Spirit. Same thing. Walks out in the congregation. There I am again. This time I'm standing up even taller. Like, mm, look at me. Hey, you know, I like wanting something from him. And he walked by again. He looked at me but looked away and he prophesied to a bunch of people and I know the people and I knew the prophecies were accurate so I was convinced he had a prophetic ability and I knew he was the one to give me the word. My wife and I holding hands ready and excited. Same thing happened. He quit. He goes to the front, gives the microphone back to the pastor. The pastor takes the microphone, starts closing the service. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming and blah, 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 blah. Now I am distraught. I'm angry, frustrated. I'm begging God, God, please, please, what do I do? Lord, you told me I'm not leaving this place until you do this. Please, I'm begging God, begging him like the Syrophoenician woman. It's been told now two, three times. No, no word for you. No word for you. No, forget it. Not even looking at me and looking away. And he goes to the back, but I, I'm pressing it. My next plan was to go tackle the man and grab him and hold him to the ground and command him to give me a word of prophecy. Of course, I wouldn't have done that, but that was my only other recourse. But at this time, as I'm praying, this is his testimony. He says he went to the back and he was looking at the section of cassette tapes where you make copies of tapes of past messages. And he's looking through the tapes when suddenly he says he felt on the inside of himself something grab hold of him and pull him backwards. As it pulled him, he turned around and almost stumbling with this force, he felt like, go to the front. And he obeyed this impulse and he went to the front and he, there was the pastor on the platform closing the service and blah, 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 blah. And he walked up and said, hey, he said, I have one more word, Pastor. I said, okay. And the pastor said, okay. And he hands in the microphone. He takes the microphone and he turns around and he looks out in the congregation and everybody's just kind of standing there like, what's going on? But there's one person out there. I'm halfway between the front and the back. I'm like 12, 12 rows back, 12 rows from the, the last. And I'm sitting there like looking and he's looking across the congregation and find this time he locks eyes with me and he looks at me. And he smiles like that, and I feel goosebumps cover me. And he says, brother, stand, stand out in the aisle. And I work my way through the aisle, kind of like when you're in a theater, you know, and then, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, you're stepping on toes. I work my way all the way out to the aisle, and I'm standing in the aisle. And he's looking at me. And then he turns around, and he looks at the front. The elders had gathered, because it was the end of the service. They were all on the platform. And he said to the pastor, and he says, brother, he says, you see, you see that man? See that young man back there? And he looked back at them and, and they said, yes. He says, that man, I have, a, I have a difficult word. It's a hard word, but I have to give it. And he looked at me. He looked at them. 
He looked back at me. He pointed at me. He looked at them and he says, that man is called south of the border to Mexico as a missionary. When he said it, I screamed. I jumped in the air about three, four meters, just like a basketball player. The whole church started screaming, clapping, hallelujah. And the pastor said, hallelujah. And the leader said, oh my. And everybody who stood and said that I wasn't found out that day, in fact, I was. And where did it come from? It come from intense prayer. Sometimes we got to pray our way through every obstacle. Prayer. You notice that keeps coming back, right? Prayer for everything. You want to be a missionary? Yeah, you need to pray. The, the last thing there in that section, and we finish with this, is you must prepare for the nations. How can you convince your pastor? You prepare. If faith without works is dead, then do something to show your faith in action. Prepare yourself by learning as much as possible about the nation you feel in your heart. Learn statistics, facts, language, etc. to better explain your desires. I do this and still do it regularly. I still find out everything I can about them. Intercede for the nation that you want to go to. Pray for that nation. Beg God to open the, find out the statistics about the country. Be like, like a, an ambassador to that country, to your own church. That there's nothing you don't know. Everything about its political system, its culture, its demographs, its history, its roots, everything. That's exactly what I knew about Mexico. I could tell my pastor everything and they all got tired. They called me Brother Mexico because they all got tired of me talking about it all the time. Same thing when I was ready to go to India. It's all I talked about was India. And you know what? When I was in India, all I talked about was Singapore. And I learned Singapore inside. You know, I memorized the entire MRT train system, every station and map before I ever came to Singapore. I could draw it from memory and write it all down. I knew everything about the history. I thought it was funny because the country was my age almost exactly by the space of just like a year. As I am 53 now, the nation also is like 54 as it grows and we over the same age. It's really all these, I learned everything I can about Singapore and I saw its strategic position as the Antioch of today. And I told everybody everywhere at that point about Singapore this and Singapore that. And it's the Antioch of the nations and it's the hinterland. And there are 17 nations within four hours reach of that country and that there are more unreached people groups within a four hour plane flight from Singapore than any other nation in the world that it is God's most strategic point and that I must be there just I studied all these things after God had told me I must come to Singapore and now I know why because I'm in that position God is good he gives a plan he gives a vision but we in our home churches, if, I'm in a, if I have somebody in my church and they come to me and God's called them, I'm, I'm certainly not going to stand in their way. But I'm not going to recommend them highly if they're not already functioning and doing something. They're going to work for another ministry. I'm not going to give a resume concerning someone. If they go to the Bible school and they do nothing, they don't hand in their outlines, that's exactly what I'm going to tell pastors that ask me about them. I'm going to be, I have to be honest. I will love them and say they're great people, but I would say they, they just had problems with their outlines. In other words, that will follow you. Don't let it do that. Study to show yourself proof. Function and do the things you do in your church. Function there. Do it. Be on the outreach. Volunteer for everything. Always show up. That's what God rewards. Intercede for the nation you're going to. Show your pastor, show the leaders, show the people in your church your focus and your sincerity. And that's just the foundation of that. So we've been looking here at the missionary and the sending church, starting with the relationship between the missionary and the pastor of the local church, convincing the pastor of your mission's call. And we haven't even gotten to you. The second part we're going to get in the next lesson will be the relationship between the missionary and the local church itself, all the other brothers and leaders and all those things. But we'll get to that later. So praise God, I'm so glad we're having this time together as we're developing here human relations in world missions, and I look forward to being again with you very soon.